1. Preface This all took place two years ago, not too long after I moved to LA from Michigan. Because of this event, I learned a lot about advocating mental illness and stigma, which I now do on a regular basis in real life and online. Mind you, this was written from the before perspective, explaining that we can't assume anything about someone regardless of beauty, stature, wealth, or appearance of it, etc., etc. It is important to be kind. Also, nowhere in there do I diagnose anyone. I am not entitled to do this because that is not my place. The word affliction should carry a neutral connotation and definition. My only harsh opinion towards those who claim to advocate awareness is that you need to think more about what cognitive dissonance means. One afternoon, I walked to my local corner store for some smokes, about a seven minute walk if you're really taking your time. As I was exiting the store, a woman approached me and politely asked for a cigarette. She was gorgeous, super short hair, looked a lot like the woman that played Claire Underwood from House of Cards. Super lean, great shape, well kept. Couldn't be older than... early 40s. Regular clothes, basically a white tank top and jeans and regular shoes. People who are homeless don't always look dirty, but my immediate impression based off of her mannerisms was that she was just taking a break from a walk or something. It was really hot outside. I live in Los Angeles County. So I obliged, and after she handed my lighter back to me, her smile suddenly disappeared, and she gets really... like... It's like she flipped a switch, and the polite, smiling woman disappeared. It felt like her eyes got dark, like she disassociated. She took a drag and looked me in the face. Do you know what the fuck is going on, or no? I had no idea what she meant, so I shook my head. There was that really mean smirk as she said, Oh, so you're a dumb bitch too, huh? I swear to fucking God, these... and slurs... Moved into our land. Took our jobs. No fucking joke. She deadass said it. You're Trejo, aren't you? I was completely shocked of this, because it was a nonsensical question. I thought it was a joke, but I could tell that it just couldn't have been. I feel as if she would have attacked me if I even replied, so I didn't respond at all. She seemed to lose perception of me while she started monologuing. It was getting more aggressive, so I managed to walk slowly away while she started raising her voice to say really horrible shit to no one. Most of it was racist, and I knew she wasn't talking directly to me, but her eyes would dart back to me. I can't explain it well. I remember getting goosebumps and immediately felt like running. Just sudden maximum adrenaline. I kept my cool and walked along the sidewalk of the busier road so there would be witnesses if I happened to be attacked or something. Thankfully, she didn't follow. This wasn't the only time. I felt like she was either waiting a run for me or something because I ran into her multiple times over the entire year of 2019, two of them being at the same corner store again. The second time was at a McDonald's on the other corner. I was picked as shit eating that good and everyone reacts to a woman crying loudly from a booth that was a few tables behind me. Dread, I don't know how, but I just knew. I couldn't bring myself to look. The manager approached her, and after asking if the woman was okay, the woman replied with, Do I look fucking okay to you? And just kind of went off. The manager threatened to call the cops, so the woman got her stuff together, and I just tried to keep my eyes down. As she passed me, right before leaving, like literally her hand pushing the door open, she backs up and glares directly at me. Hey, hey, fucking look at me. Y'all, this woman, she radiated wrath. Mama didn't raise no bitch, but I'm not fearless. For the first time in a very long time, I was actually afraid to death of another person. I looked up and she asked my name. Hi, I'm OP, she responded with, You're full of shit, you're Danny, aren't you? Is that you, Trejo? I tried to assure her that I was not, in fact, Danny Trejo, and apologized for being unable to help her find him. She then said, Well, next time you see him, tell him to go fuck himself. Flipped me the bird and left. The employees checked on me, but I stayed in that McDonald's for an extra hour just to be safe. I had my roommate pick me up and drive me home since I'd walked. It was less than a ten minute walk, broad daylight, I just couldn't find the strength to do it and my body felt so weak and shaky anyway. 
I hadn't cried about being afraid of another person in over ten years. Being so afraid of someone who is potentially my neighbor, someone who might be following me? I saw her in passing at least once a week that year, until I got too scared to leave my home. We were complete strangers, and I didn't do anything to her except bum her a cigarette. The final time I ran into her was at the corner store again, months five or six of running into her. She was wearing really nice satin or silk pajamas, clean white fuzzy slippers, and had a cig in her hand. She saw me walking down the sidewalk, and I didn't have a choice but to look down and pass her. I ended up looking up and gave her kind of a weak smile, like a just-passing-through, kind of softer than a hello co-worker scrunched face. You know? She still looked so evil, and I saw that she watched as I rounded the corner. I bolted. Sprinting home takes less than a few minutes, but it felt like forever. I couldn't bring myself to go to the corner store for months after that, especially by myself, after having lived in the area for three years and befriending the clerks. My neighborhood isn't even a high crime area, and I've never felt unsafe until that happened. Just a note to reiterate from one afflicted about another, this story is not meant to find actual humor out of those with illness or trauma or addiction. As absurd as it happened, this woman has an affliction that somehow convinced her that I am an actual enemy in a way that made me feel legitimately threatened. I haven't seen her in a year, thankfully, and I hope she finds some kind of help. Afflicted Claire Underwood lookalike, I'm sorry for whatever you've been through, but I really hope we never meet again. If we do, I hope that you'll be well enough to see that I am actually a 28-year-old female and very... Very white. Two. I'll begin by giving you a little background. At the time this happened, I was a 16-year-old female, working at a chain coffee place while in high school. I'm in college now, I'm 19, seven hours away from said place. This happened at a time in my life in which I was super shy, and had a tough time standing up for myself. In retrospect, I could have handled it a lot better. I used to work closing shifts with my best friend after school. It'd be like from 3 to 10 p.m. or 5 to 10 p.m. We worked at a relatively dead store, so we spent most of our time playing music and talking. We did our duties, like taking the trash out and restocking, etc. Although both of us always dreaded taking the trash out as we had to go out back, the dumpsters were behind the store in a dimly lit area next to a sketchy liquor store. One night a man came in. It wasn't unusual to have customers come near closing. It was just uncommon to see anyone we didn't already know. Our store was mostly just regulars. He was lanky and probably around 30. I mostly just remember his eyes. They were piercing. The type that never break a stare. I remember initially thinking he was attractive. Yikes. The way he spoke was short and concise, just ordering a small hot latte. I made his order and that was it. I told my friend about how I thought he was attractive, and we then started referring to him as the small hot latte guy. We always call people by the drink orders. He came in a bunch of times after that, each time staying a little longer and longer, talking a little more and more. One day he came with a woman, presumably his girlfriend. I remember I felt a little weird, like she was staring at me or like they had spoken about me beforehand. She glanced over at him and said, Wow, she is pretty. I didn't think much of it, said thank you, served them, and I thought that would be the end of it. He then began showing up and talking to me a lot without her. He started off as being friendly. I honestly don't even know what we talk about. I think music. Then he got kind of flirty. Initially, I was just flattered, but being underage and immature, I didn't even think about the fact that it was kind of alarming. He began to stay for a while. Sometimes he would bring a laptop or a notebook. I could feel him staring at me and listening to our conversations. But at that point, I wasn't getting creep vibes from him. As my co-worker and I had dealt with our fair share of creeps. He then somehow got my number. To this day, I honestly don't know how. He texted me, and somehow I still wasn't creeped out. We would talk about music a lot. Then I began to learn more about him. 
He was in his late thirties and had prior problems with substance abuse that he never really got into. He went back to school for art and would show me his pieces. He'd also send a lot of pictures of nature. I thought they were... nice? Looking back, they were actually pretty creepy. For example, a picture of his backyard sent at like 3am. He'd stay and work on his art as well. He then told me he barely enjoyed hot lattes, he just wanted to come see me. He would come in and begin giving me gifts. This was the point I finally started realizing that I did not like the situation. He began by giving little snacks or drinks. I would accept, but would never eat or drink them. It wasn't that I necessarily thought he had ill intentions, I just had a hard time accepting gifts. I remember one night he brought me a book about one of his favorite artists. I reluctantly took it, but had tried to decline before. I remember telling him about one of my favorite musicians and sent him a link to a performance I really liked. He started being kind of sexual while still talking about the song. He then began talking super suggestively, and I would laugh it off and decline when he'd ask to send pictures. I began talking less and less and told my friend about the situation. She agreed that it was getting creepy and that I should maybe change my schedule. I told her I'd be fine, I'm stubborn. He'd still come by every week at closing time, and he'd even stay in his car till we closed, meaning he'd watch me go to the back to take the trash out. I began making excuses as to why I couldn't talk and began going to the back of the store when I'd see him. He then sent me a bunch of texts about how graceful I looked while working. I didn't respond. He kept texting me, and I told him I didn't want to talk anymore. He sent a bunch of messages describing how much I meant to him and how he wouldn't be okay. I started freaking out. I blocked his number. Still, I returned to work. I honestly thought he stopped coming. I was wrong. I felt uneasy the whole shift. My friend said that if he came in, to just go to the back and wait it out. I saw his car coming and my heart sank. I was on the verge of tears and hurried to the back. I could hear them talking, but couldn't decipher what exactly was being said. Then, about ten minutes later, she came to the back. I could visibly see that she was very upset. We ended up both just crying and hugging each other. Not the first time we've done that. She told me he kept asking to see me and asking how I was, and she just kept refusing. She told him how I was underage and how he made me feel uncomfortable. He wouldn't give up. Eventually, she threatened him and he left. We were both shaken up, but I thought it was over. It was time to take out the trash and lock up, and we both felt okay. I was opening the door while juggling like three bags of trash and saw something on the ground. I was confused at first, but then realized what I saw. It was flowers and a note. I felt sick to my stomach and looked around the parking lot. I didn't see his car. I threw them out immediately and told my friend I didn't want to read the note. She read it and told me I had to. It was something to the effect of... I have never felt so connected to someone. You're breaking my heart. Please don't do this, I'm sorry. Etc. Looking back, I honestly didn't lead him on, but initially I just had felt as if I was in the wrong. Nonetheless, we turned the corner to take the trash out, and both prayed the parking lot was empty. It wasn't. Let's just say the trash was not going to get taken out that night. I continued working there and still work there on my breaks from college. I had different hours after that and the summer I was going to leave for my freshman year I saw him again. It was around 3pm. It was busy. We made eye contact. He left. That was the last time I saw him. Looking back I was so naive and could have handled the situation so much better. I am forever thankful to my friend. So yeah, small, hot latte guy who forever tainted my love for espresso. Let's not meet again. 3. This happened way back in October of 2006. At that time, I was just a 19-year-old kid, always on the lookout for adventure. One Friday night, after wrapping up my shift at McDonald's, I met up with some friends who suggested we check out this haunted location called White's Bridge. My one buddy, Brandon, said he had recently learned about it, 
and began telling us the legends associated with the 100-year-old wood-covered bridge. Never one to turn down a spooky experience, we all piled into my green Ford Taurus and headed out on our journey. Brandon gave directions, guiding me off the main road, and within minutes we were on the dirt back roads, surrounded by woods and cornfields. Our only point of reference was a blinking cell tower off in the distance. We could tell we were getting further from the city as our cell phones began slowly losing service. As we rode deeper and deeper into what legitimately felt like the absolute middle of nowhere, Brandon repeated the legend associated with the bridge. Back in the early 1900s, a local farmer discovered that his beloved wife had been cheating on him, and in a fit of rage he killed her and her lover after discovering them in the act. After committing the cold-blooded murder, the farmer left his home and wandered the dirt roads in a daze. He eventually came upon White's Bridge, where the realization of what he had done finally began to sink in and deciding he would rather die than face the consequences of his actions. He hoisted a rope up and over one of the bridge's rafters and hung himself. As far as I can tell now, this story is complete fiction, but we totally believed it at the time. After a long and bumpy ride, Brandon instructed me to turn right on an off-road. I wouldn't even have noticed was there had he not pointed it out. I took the turn and... There before us was White's Bridge. It looked like something straight out of a horror film. An old wood-covered bridge, aged by time, sitting alone above a river deep in the middle of nowhere. We parked the car on the side of the road and got out to explore. Immediately catching our eyes was a scarecrow lying abandoned at the entrance to the bridge. My friend Mike, who was known as somewhat of a risk-taker and a stupid one at that, picked up the scarecrow and lit it on fire. The hay body burst up into a ball of flames and Mike waved it around proudly next to the old dry wood bridge. Realizing the risk, I told him to throw the damn thing in the river and put it out, which thankfully he did. After making sure there weren't any rogue embers that could ignite the bridge, Brandon suggested we get back in the car and pull it onto the bridge. He explained that the legend was that if you parked your car in the middle of the bridge, put it in neutral and killed the engine the spirit of the dead farmer would push the vehicle forward to get it off the bridge. Naturally, we had to try this. We piled back in and did exactly as he said. We parked halfway across the rickety old bridge and killed the engine. We sat in the pitch black, saying nothing, waiting for something, anything, to happen. The only signs were the creaking of the bridge, the river flowing beneath us, and... Footsteps! Suddenly, the back driver's side door opens and a woman abruptly enters the back seat, cramming in next to my two friends back there. She looked to be in her late twenties, early thirties, long straight black hair, slim, and wearing a plaid shirt and blue jeans. It's been a while, but this is essentially how I remember the conversation going. I saw your fire signal for me. Uh, wait, what? I replied, totally freaked out and at a complete loss for words. I'm so glad you came. My boyfriend's car broke down that way. I need a ride back. My brain was doing its best to compute the situation. I'm sorry, but who are you? I asked. What are you doing out here? I told you. My boyfriend's car broke down over there. Can you please just give me a ride back so I don't have to walk all the way back? She was pointing ahead toward a narrow road that forked off to the right on the other side of the bridge. My friend Mike, the scarecrow burner, and ever the gentleman added, I mean, if you need a place to stay, you're more than welcome to come crash at my place. I got plenty to drink, and... No, lady, listen, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are, you just got in my car, and this is all really weird. You could be an axe murderer for all I know. I'm sorry, you have to get out. She glared at me in the rearview mirror. If looks could kill, I would have been done for. But you signaled for me. We weren't signaling for you. Get out. She let out an angry sigh and got out, walking back in the direction from which she came and disappearing into the night. I started the engine right up and looked at my friends. They all had looks of disbelief on their face. Without saying a word, I put the car in drive and slowly rolled forward and off the bridge. We needed to turn around and go back across the bridge to get to where we had come from, 
and the only way to do that was to pull up onto the side of the road that the woman said her boyfriend's car had broken down on, and then reverse. As I pulled onto the side of the road, my headlights illuminated the three posted signs that I hadn't been able to see from the bridge. No trespassing, private property, and do not enter. Looking up the road, there was no sign of the woman. Wherever she went, it didn't appear she went that way. I didn't want to stick around, though, so I backed up and crossed the bridge again, and from there I began the journey home. We didn't have much to say in the ride home. I think we were all equally stunned, except for Mike, who asked if we knew anyone who would be awake at this hour that he could score some wheat from. I visited White's Bridge a couple other times after that, but nothing of note happened in my subsequent visits. Sadly, some delinquents burned down the old White's Bridge some years ago. It was rebuilt, but from what I hear, it's just not the same as the original. I don't have any plans to go and check it out. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 541. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. I'd also like to give a special shout out to one of our one of our friends here. Uh, it goes by the name of it's either Datrabor or Datrabor. Uh, I just call him Bob. So happy 60th birthday to you, Bob. I hope you have a nice time. I know you had a special dinner planned, so I hope that goes well and everything is uh, everything is extra yummy for you. And you have a very happy and pleasant day on your birthday. And of course, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Bob, happy birthday to you. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.